Hi, and welcome to the 100th episode of the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Paul Hill from Utah State University Extension. I'll be one of your co-hosts for this special episode. Uh, we're turning the tables uh, on your regular host, Bob Birch. Uh, this time, Bob will be answering the questions as we talk uh, with him about the podcast, uh, Cooperative Extension, and more. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Connie Hancock from Nebraska Extension. Hi, Connie. Hi, Paul. How are you doing today? Oh, doing great. Good. Well, I'm just excited about turning the tables on Bob and finally getting a chance to interrogate him as he's inter interrogated over 99 of uh, our colleagues across the nation. So it's going to be fun. Goes around, comes around, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, now let's welcome Bob. Uh, Bob Birch, uh, he's the host of the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Paul and Connie, for doing this. Yeah, I appreciate it. I didn't, uh, I think it was Ann Adrian who said, uh, she said, hey, Bob's coming up on 100 episodes. You should, uh, she was tweeting or something. You, you should interview him. And I'm like, uh, never done that before. But uh, this looks like a fun opportunity. So uh, you ready to get started? Yeah. And after this, you guys only have 99 episodes to go to catch up. So. <laughs> All right. So, um, Bob. Briefly tell us about you, um, your path to that kind of led you to Cooperative Extension in North Dakota. Uh, so Paul knows me pretty well because he, he added briefly to the beginning of that. So uh, as a reminder, um, well, I'm, I'm a North Dakota native, lived here all my uh, 40 some years. Um, and uh, I started out my career actually in public broadcasting. So I worked at a public radio station in Grand Forks, North Dakota on the, on the campus of the University of North Dakota are now, you know, now my arch rivals uh, here up the road on, on Interstate 29 um, and spent uh, you know, quite a few years there, um, you know, about eight years there and then went on uh, to a short time at, at public television station, our statewide public television station, Prairie Public Television, and and then uh, actually got into higher ed, even though I was on a, a higher ed campus when I was at the radio station for a lot of years. Um, I started work at Mayville State University, and that's really where I got sort of fully fledged into the technology part of my job, because my job here at NDSU is a web technology specialist. That's what I was hired to do, not to talk on, on podcasts and, um, you know, uh, do media and those kinds of things, but to actually manage websites and train people on using the web. So uh, at Mayville State, that's where I got involved in that as the webmaster and eventually a director of, of online learning. Um, and then I had an opportunity to come here to NDSU and work for Extension, again, doing, doing that web technology stuff. Um, and you know, that's, that's sort of how I came to, to NDSU. And currently I talk to NDSU Extension staff about web technology, social media, uh, online networks, and a lot of other stuff as well. Thanks. Your background really fits really nicely in a natural for a podcast situation because you've really had lots of experience in that scenario, Bob. So as you think about that past as well, what was the turning point for you then to pursue um, learning about collaborative networks and this whole culture of innovation? Well, I, you know, I think it's sort of been something that uh, I've been a, a rabble rouser probably since I started uh, my career uh, many years ago. I was just always looking for something different. You know, if I, th I think about it, um, you know, back when I was working in public radio uh, was when the community journalism movement was starting. And so we were really talking about, you know, not just talking at people, but talking with people uh, in terms of journalism. And uh, that's kind of carried over. So that's always been a stream that's kind of run through of um, my career and sort of my personal philosophy in terms of, you know, we can do more together than we can individually. And so uh, as I got involved in extension, uh, at NDSU, I was, probably, I was only probably here about a year or so before uh, Ann Adrian's name comes up again, but Ann and, and Kevin Gamble and some other colleagues started the Network Literacy Community of Practice, um, and I was invited to be a part of that, and um, actually I'm still uh, partially funded through the Network Literacy Community of Practice, now through the Military Families Learning Network, and that was really the introduction to 
you know, I got involved in it because of social networking and being involved in social media. Um, but, but being involved in the network literacy community of practice really introduced me to the whole idea of networking um, and uh, how networks operate, you know, in our ecology, in our environment, uh, in our business situations and, and how they can be helpful in, in addressing the big challenges that we face as, as a country and as a, as a planet. So, um, so that's really how it got started was through the network literacy community of practice. And recently, uh, I know Connie's read this book um, in the last couple of years, this book connecting to change the world by Peter Plastrick and Madeline Taylor. Um, and I'm forgetting the third co-author there, but uh, connecting to change the world is an important book in sort of synthesizing all of that and putting it into practice, not just making a theory that human networks can have a big impact, but actually saying how to build them. Very good. Yeah, so, so when you think about um, leveraging co collaboration uh, networks and you think about the future of extension, what excites you, what would you say excites you the most about the future of extension? Hmm. Well, I think it is that opportunity to be involved in networks. Um, I've said this probably many times to many different people. So for some of the people who are listening, like if, if Steve Judd is listening now, he's like, oh, I get it, Bob. I've heard that before. Um, but the biggest challenge with organizations is the point, sort of a, well, to use Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point thing, but sort of a tipping point where the um, survival of the organization, continuing the organization, uh, starts to potentially outweigh the mission of the organization. And, and I've experienced this in, in not-for-profits, you know, when working in art, local arts councils and things like that. It's like, you know, are you willing as an organization to once you actually accomplish your goal, you know, to go out of business? And um, I think not that extension is going out of business or that we've accomplished everything that we've, that, that um, the Smith Lever Act is, has charged us with doing, but I think there was at least a, a certain stagnation in the last 15 years or so, um, maybe longer. And the opportunity to work on you know, what uh, some people call grand challenges or wicked problems I think that's what's got me the most excited about it because it's, it's no longer about solving problems one person at a time. It, um, not that that's value, not valuable, but it's about actually making big change in the world. You know, if you think about the logic model, and Connie and I were just talking about this this morning on another meeting. Um, if you think about the logic model, it's really built on this idea as like, I teach one person something as a result, their behavior changes. If I teach enough one people, then I can make some kind of situational change to the environment, to the economy, um, to the society in some way. Um, and what network thinking really, uh, the approach that we take to that is that, you know, lots of people working on the same problem from z different perspectives at the same time and sharing information about it can do a much better job of addressing a complex issue than training one person at a time to change their behavior. So, I don't know, I'm going, I, I told you at the beginning, I was not going to do this stream of consciousness rambling, but here I am. Yeah. So, that's what's got me the most excited, right? Extension educators, professionals, agents, whatever you want to call us, um, are uniquely positioned to help these collective action networks change the world, you know, to, bo to borrow Peter Plastrick's uh, phrase about connecting to change the world. Um, through because of so many different ways that we can affect that situation. We can affect it educationally. We can um, make, make problems less complex by bringing research-based information to them. That's sort of our traditional role. But mm -hmm. Extension is so great at facilitation. Uh, our geographic uh, dispersion across the country allows us to touch people and, and connect people in ways that uh, might not be possible in other organizations. So there's all kinds of capacity for cooperative extension to work within networks, which then increases the broader capacity to address the big challenges of water and climate and food security and health that, that we face in the country. So as you're talking, Bob, it comes to mind, um, 
I did a um, Facebook training um, this last spring, and it was, we did some one-on-one -on -one consultations, and then we did a group thing with a colleague in Mississippi who actually used Zoom to, to do some teaching. But as I reflect back on that training, the one-on-one -on -one consultations help those people much more uh, effectively change their behavior of their online presence versus not. So do you find that, or as you think about this whole working differently thing, that there's still a, a time when one-on-one -on -one is still okay and that networks are really for greater conversations and greater issues? I mean, I'm just trying to think about that out loud. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a couple things. It's one is sort of what are you trying to accomplish, right? What are you trying to change? Um, but even sort of uh, maybe what we might think of as a straightforward uh, way of changing things. You know, recently did a podcast. Um, I'm not going to try and call out names because I'll forget somebody but with a group who is working on, who wrote a paper in, in a journal of extension on, on rural health inequities. I mean, you guys might have, might have heard that. And it, I think it really drives this point home because we might as extension professionals just think, well, it's a pretty simple formula, right? We know that walking makes people healthier for lots of different reasons, right? Even, even mental health could be helped by walking. There's research to support that. So, so we know through research, walking helps people be more healthy. So all we have to do, right, is change their behavior and make them walk more. What, what we talked about in the podcast about rural health inequities is like, that's great, except some people don't have sidewalks, right? Some people don't have a gym that they can go to. Mm -hmm. uh, some, and, and those are things that, what, what, what does extension do about that? What can we do about it, right? And there's not a lot that we can do about it, but working within a network like they have to address things, you know, food systems areas in, the, in Minnesota and in the Appalachians and, and all over the country, um, we can have people that we're connected with who do work on some of those issues, policy issues and, and uh, infrastructure issues and things that, uh, that we can't control and that the people we're trying to change their behavior can't control. So, so I think I look at it that way, yeah. Working one-on-one -on -one with somebody is an effective way to change their behavior. But the, the question I'm asking is that working one-on-one -on -one with people, one person at a time, does it really change the country or the community or, the, or society? Um, and it, it, I'm not saying we're having no impact. Obviously, we're having some impact. I just don't think we're having the greatest impact that we could if we were you know, addressing some of these things that we don't have the ability to control that can't be solved just through education. If you had to give extension a grade on how well they're doing at that, what would you, what would you assign our system? Um, I would, I don't like grades. I would call it <laughs> needs improvement. Um, uh, you know, so I'm not going to, I'm not, not to get into all of what I believe about letter grades, because we can have a whole conversation about that, but I'm not going to assign a assign a letter grade. This is new, right? It's it's not just new. You know, people say, "Well, is it new?" We've been talking about this for you know years and years, and you know, maybe even you know, 15, 20 years of talking about uh, networks and and their ability, human networks and their ability to to change society. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, I mean, we're, uh, we're more than a century old as an organization. In the grand scheme of things, it hasn't been that long. Um, I think that the needs improvement part is sort of caught up in what I brought up before. Is like a lot of things that we focus on as a system, um, you know, are tied up in how do we continue as a system and not focus necessarily on how do we accomplish our mission or solve big problems. And so the more that we can sort of shift that, and I, and, you know, I, get in this, I get in conversations about this all the time. I understand we need money and we need federal funding, we need state funding, we need county funding, and we need you know, stakeholders to support us and all that stuff is important. We need to have our brand on things and all of that stuff. I'm not saying that goes away. I'm just saying when you're making big decisions about a state system, about a national system, that we're focused on solving the problems more than 
uh, sustaining organization. And we run into this. All, I mean, I think, you know, Paul, you and Jamie and I have talked about it maybe on previous podcasts, even of just this idea that uh, has been there, you know, I'm sure before I started an extension, like when you bring up things like social media or even websites, like, oh, is that going to put us out of business? Or, you know, if we tell people to go to the website, then why do we have agents? Or, you know, if we're in social media, then, then why should we be in every county? And then the, the county offices are going to go away. So there is this natural, not criticizing it, but this natural idea of protect our turf um, and kind of sustain status quo. And so when we go back and talk about innovation, that's, uh, that's really not healthy for innovation to have an attitude of sustain the status quo. So as much as we can get away from that, uh, the more likely we are to embrace some things like a networked approach. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I just listened to um, the podcast that you did with Dr. Hibbard um, from Nebraska um, again. And every time I listen to that, I get more understanding of the learner engagement concepts. And, you know, the question was around um, the expert model. And granted, we have, what you're saying is we have the expert model, but the experts sometimes need to open up their minds to the other people out there who are also experts and have something to contribute to um, the conversation around an issue or a grand challenge or um, whatever the topic is, because there may be a better way than what the expert model has to offer. Yeah. I mean, there's just more, there's, you know, that's why we talk about complexity when we talk about these, these grand challenges. They're complex. They're not easy to solve, right? If there was a solution to climate, right? Somebody would just come up with it. Um, you know, Elon Musk or something would just go, Oh, I invented this switch. You just turn it and climate solved. Um, it doesn't work that way. It's much more complex. There's way more stuff that goes into it. So we can't continue to just, uh, if we really want to change the problem or affect the issue, we can't just continue to kind of hit it from our particular perspective. That doesn't make our perspective not valuable, right. like the expert model. I mean, that's why I bring up the idea that one way to affect these issues is to redu reduce complexity. And some of that reduction in complexity is could be through the expert model, right? I teach you about something that makes it more understandable, makes the technical parts of the problem uh, less complex. And, uh, and that's one way of addressing the issue. Um, I did a podcast a while back, it's quite a while back now with, with Jamie Bain and, and uh, Noel Harden um, and Stephanie Heim from the University of Minnesota, and they're working in food systems networks. And I, I asked a question um, to Jamie, and I, I basically said, well, how do we get extension people, all extension people, to embra embrace this networked approach? And she's like, why would you want to do that? Uh, and I was like, I'm scrambling. Oh, well, um, and she, uh, she said, you know, not everybody's going to be good at it. Not everybody's a facilitator. Not everybody's a network weaver. Uh, you know, some people are good at the expert model, and we shouldn't tell them, stop doing it, you know, go do something else. Let them be good at the expert model. Um, and that's one way to address it. It's just that there's so many different ways, so many other perspectives that we can come at these grand challenges to actually make an impact on them than just the expert model. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're diverting a little bit from where Paul and I had originally thought we were going to take this, but um, after interviewing 99 innovators in Extension, what do you view the challenges are for Extension faculty to move towards this working differently? Well, you know, Paul and Jamie from the EdTech LN have asked this question too, and I think I'd, we've identified a lot of different, a lot of different things that um, are challenges. Uh, I would guess, the, you know, one thing is just, um, it's just this, this idea of, of maintaining the status quo. And that's not like I, you ask people, you know, I don't, you don't go interview. If I went upstairs and interviewed my director right now, I'm like, do you really want to, are you concerned with maintaining the status quo? He wouldn't say, 
yes, that's my objective. Let's not innovate. Let's not move forward. But there are just systems in place, practices in place that, um, you know, that are, that, that continue that cycle. You know, one of them, and, and I know this has come up in other conversations, um, I think with you, Paul, is like, we can have uh, conversations about being innovative and doing things differently and changing that and get all excited about them. And then as a, an educator, an agent, and obviously, Connie, you know this too, you get back to your desk and it's the same old list of things that you have to address based on, you know, people in your county with needs or county government with needs. And uh, I remember an eye-opening moment here at NDSU Extension. I didn't know a ton about Extension when I started here. And I was sitting in a, a meeting with uh, ed, uh, agents who had been out for a year and they were coming back to campus to, you know, sort of have a second round of orientation and talk about their experience. And one of them asked one of our assistant directors, like, am I supposed to be the secretary for the weed board? And I was like, uh, and she's like, well, not if you don't want to, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's not part of your job description, but there are things like that because of our structure that are, I don't want to say distracting us, but I mean, they, they, we have to set priorities, right? And if you are the secretary of the weed board, you don't get to do, you know, something else. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest threat is like, you're, we're a hundred year old institution we have baggage, uh, we have practices and approaches and policies um, that have sort of set the way that we uh, do things. And that could be a real challenge. I, um, the podcast that is, as we record this, the new podcast that'll come out today uh, is with Keith Smith and Keith led up the innovation task force that Paul was a part of. And, you know, and I think I asked Paul and Jamie this on a previous podcast too, is like, how do we be innovative and change an organization whose purpose is written in legislation? Right? I mean, it says, you know, I don't remember exactly what it says. I'm not going to be able to quote Smith Lever Act here, but you know, basically take research-based information and get it out to people to change their practices. And, you know, when we try to do things differently, sometimes we're running a foul of that possibly in some ways. So how do you, uh, how do you really remake and, and reinvent an organization when your purpose is, is written in legislation? I think that's probably the biggest challenge is just the, I don't know what to call it, you know, just the gravity of, all, of our hundred years of how we've done things. Well, it's changing tradition. And, and at the same time, for those of us who work in local, at the local level, we have local responsibilities to to build and to build relationships with, and so it does become that um, catch twenty two of being part of the weed board, maybe not being secretary, but at least being at the table to have the conversation. If that's one of the issues that I'm concerned about, or the the groups that I need to be part of, so. Uh, but I still think the, the point that you make about the network mindset, I think, still fits into even those of us that are at the local level. But there is some things that we have to give up, and that's all part of this prioritizing and um, being able to address those issues. Yeah, Yeah, and to pull it back to the podcast guests, I mean, that's been the theme right? It's sort of just a just do it theme. Like, I mean, I, I don't ask it very often because it's sort of become uh, redundant to ask that uh, because it's the same answer. I'm like, well, what do your administrators think about this? And most people, when I ask them that say, uh, I don't think they have any clue what I'm doing. So I didn't ask permission. And someday if I need to, I'll ask forgiveness, but I'm just doing it. Yeah. Um, and I think that speaks to the need to sort of, uh, to, if to really be innovative, to kind of get away from the gravity of the bureaucracy, the organization, all of that stuff. That is not to say that we don't have leaders and administrators who don't embrace change. You mentioned Dr. Hibbard. Chuck is one of them um, who, really, who really does that, and we have many others across the country. It's just to say there's just stuff, right? And when you, when you all of us know an extension, when we ask, like, can I do this? Do I have permission to do this? It seems more often than not, it's like we come up with 18 reasons why not, right? Well, I don't know. We should run that through university administration, or I don't know if that fits with this, you know, and maybe it's, it's duplication. Maybe somebody's doing it over here. 
more often than not, when I ask an innovator in the podcast, you know, how did you get started? It's not asking permission or doing a proposal. It's just, I just did it. So Bob, I want to uh, kind of change gears here and just ask you, um, you read a lot. So what book would you say has had the greatest impact on your career? Uh, do you, a book that where you look back and you're like, man, I've, I've applied a lot of these things to um, my actual career. Oh boy. That's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, I won't. <laughs> that's, that's a tough one. Um, that I've can, you, can you list a few, a few books that, uh, that you think a, a, uh, extension professional would benefit from reading? Oh yeah, that, that's a pretty easy one. So, um, I mentioned connecting and change the world already. Peter Plastrick, Madeline Taylor, and the poor unnamed third author who's, you know, doesn't care that this podcast exists and doesn't care that his name's not getting mentioned. Um, uh, working out loud, John Stepper. I mean, it's, these are things that have been sort of in the, uh, extension zeitgeist recently. So, um, I think those are, are good ones. You know, as we've been talking about innovation, uh, I've gone back to good to great a few times. And I think people are, you know, a lot of people are familiar uh, with that particular book. Um, I like stuff that um, I have a lit background. So I was an English major in college and, you know, and so I really um, have brought up in, in some recent conversations, uh, Sebastian Younger's uh, tribes book that just came out. Um, it doesn't really have much to do with extension at all. It's not a business book. It's not an education book. Um, but it, there's a lot of points of connection uh, when we talk about network stuff, when we talk about um, our culture and our community um, and how we relate to one another. Um, so that's, you know, those are things, those are ones that, that come to mind. Um, one more, Steven Johnson, uh, where good ideas come from. That's a huge one because I, like many of us who, uh, you know, went through K-12 and, and higher ed at, in the United States, we have been fed the myth of the uh, solo innovator, the Eureka moment, Thomas Edison, and all these individual innovators. And, and we've been told that that's, you have to be some kind of super genius and, you know, as a single person, come up with these wonderful ideas and they're all yours. And uh, Stephen Johnson's book blows that up everything's built on someone else's ideas. Once you get that through your head, uh, then you can start to let go of things like ownership of ideas and work in a more collaborative way and say, Hey, I'm just going to throw an idea out there and let's all build upon it and make something cool. So. Well, I think we could go on for another hour or so um, asking questions above. No one would uh, listen to that, Connie. So. <laughs> well, maybe we need to do a part two, Paul. <laughs> but um, as you can tell, Bob is one of the, the really innovative thinkers in our system across the country. And I really have appreciated the um, opportunity to work with Bob um, here in Nebraska as well as um, on some other projects. Um, I think his networked mindset is just fabulous and he gets me to thinking differently about the work that I do and therefore I can help others um, think differently and work differently in extension. So um, really appreciate the opportunity to have interviewed you on the 100th episode of Working Differently in Extension. Congratulations. We look forward to the next 200. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Connie. And thanks, Paul, for doing this. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today on Working Differently in um, Extension podcast. You can follow Bob um, on Twitter at WDNEXT. That's W-D-I-N-E-X-T. All of these podcasts are available on SoundCloud. If you go to soundcloud.com slash working differently, and you'll find some show notes of the episode at bobbirch.com. So Bob is networked in multiple different ways. Thanks for listening and have a great day.